The corruption has spread past his legs, all the way up to his navel by the time I managed to pull him up from the muck. The skin that hadn't fallen off was blackened, gangrenous, and peeling. Where rot and decay were absent, inflammation and unmitigable bleeding were present. It seemed like every possible manner of dermal affliction assailed the limbs and the waist and the groin. My friend had long ceased to writhe in agony. In his mind, he'd already lost those accursed portions of his body. Slowly, laboriously, I hauled him away from the mire where we had found the sky-fallen artifact earlier in the day. Before, the waters had been clear, filled with life, but with the arrival of that vile and polluting idol, the pond had transformed into a swampish cesspool. All life therein had been extinguished, eaten away by alien particles or corrosive emissions, until naught but the porous and partially liquefied bones of fish remained. Eventually we reached the field, about three acres from the corrupted pond. By then, my friend had again lost consciousness, and his lower half had mostly fallen away. A gruesome trail of festering organic matter extended towards the bog we just escaped. A few meters away, a half-rotted foot rested in the grass, where a swarm of flies had already begun their grisly work. Scraps of flesh, exposed in yellow bone, and dissolving sinew were all that remained below his stomach. Somehow, through some ironic twist of human resilience, he continued to hold on, continued to succumb to the torturous corruption and elude the mercy of death. There was no living soul around for miles. We had camped in a nearby cabin, owned by his late grandfather, and had planned on fishing in the pond, hiking in the nearby hills, and exploring the woodland areas which encircled the entire region. Despite his grandfather having owned and frequented the remote cabin, my friend wasn't much of an outdoorsman himself, but he couldn't think of a better way for us to hang out by ourselves, something we hadn't had the opportunity to do for a while since the birth of his daughter. Looking down at him, horrifically reduced to half a man, I felt my heart tighten. I knew that this trip, this nightmarishly sabotaged trip, would conclude with me having to tell his wife and daughter that he had died. And worse, I would have to come up with a believable reason, for the truth was too terrible, too appalling, to tell those kind-hearted, spiritually innocent people. A rock sat on the ground nearby. I decided that, given the circumstances, it would be better for my friend to die now, oblivious to the death stroke, than awake and feel the ravenous corruption eat away at him, inch by inch. I picked up the rock, knelt over my friend, and raised it above my head. Suddenly his eyes flicked open, and I recoiled, for in them I saw not the withering life of a man, of a friend, but the inhuman gaze of someone, no, something else, a gaze almost bestial in his unrestrained hunger, and yet I sensed an intelligence beyond any beast, beyond man, lurking deep within it. The face of my friend, behind which rested a consciousness not his own, smiled, and said, Go on. Do it. Bring the rock crashing down upon the skull, and fully end the life that clings to existence within. Once it is done, I will take control. I will fully emerge, whole, corporeal, and will put this body to uses unintended and unprecedented. I stumbled away from the body, terror bursting in my chest. The voice had spoken with a callousness, as a fulcral in notation that suggested his speaker held from far off abysms or lightless subterranean depths, rather than a small town in Montana. The rock had remained in my grasp, and instinct impelled me to use it, to batter and collapse the skull of this diabolic speaker masquerading as my friend. But I had sensed no deception in his words. I believed, totally, that his dark prophecy would come true if I were to end the life of the body's original, natural inhabitant. The speaker, perhaps sensing my unease and indecision, began cackling in black-hearted mockery. I felt anger swell in my chest, battling against the already present terror, a chaos of emotions and compulsions. My human spirit was torn. Half of it wanted to finally silence the mockery. The other half wanted to flee, and leave it there to fester in the grass forever, 
until that wicked soul within faded to oblivion, its possession unfulfilled. Leave me here and I'll only sink into the land. I will imbue my anima within every insect, every rodent, every creature, tirelessly climbing the hierarchical ladder of the animal kingdom until, perhaps as a wolf or coyote, I may range away from this unpeopled land and snap my jaws on the limb of some unsuspecting human. And then, having been only slightly delayed, I will begin my conquest of this planet. And even then, my ascent will not stop. Unbeknownst to your pitiful species, which has ignorantly prided itself on its sovereignty above all lovers, there exists higher orders of being on this very planet. Entities and sapient species of nature that watch from the depths of virgin darkness, or listen through untapped channels, or perceive through other incomprehensible means. I will become one with these as easily as I have become one with your pitiful friend. I will become a supreme being, and your civilizations will fall before me, as so many throughout this mundane universe have. The speaker ended his tyrannical proclamation with a laugh that pierced my very soul and caused all hope to be burned from my heart, just as the flesh of my friend had been eaten away by the caustic swamp gunk. In this doom which the speaker had promised towards my people, towards my planet, shook me to my core. In the utter horror of it, the bleakness of total annihilation, quelled the anger which had blossomed in indignance and defiance. I fell to my knees, and the rock rolled from my hands. The sun itself seemed to be dimmed by some imperceptible atmospheric obstruction, as if a gloom had arrived on some visibly undetectable wavelength. The sky was cloudless, the sun immediately overhead, yet a chill settled upon my skin, and I drew my arms around myself. The grass around me curled inward, the few flowers which dotted the field shriveled and wilted. Nature itself recoiled, cringed away from this being who was immicable to all forms of terrene life. Just when I thought there was no hope whatsoever, and that it would be better to lie upon the withering grass than choose either doom-promising course of action, something was revealed to me. A ray of light, powerful, celestial, pierced the sun's subduing gloom, and shone itself in an object in my friend's pocket. The object reflected the light, twinkling dimly despite the oppressive forces acting upon the atmosphere. It was my friend's lighter. He always carried it within him, despite having given up smoking with the birth of his daughter. He told me that it was a repurposed memento of sorts, a reminder to never forget the danger of one's vices. The top of the silver casing stuck out just over the edge of his shirt pocket. As if it had completed his task, the ray of light faded. It had come and gone undetected by the body-haunting incubi. A plan then came into formation in my mind, although I cannot say with certainty that it was entirely of my conception. His inspiration was that lighter, revealed to me seemingly by providence. Without offering a word of warning or explanation, I went over to the body, knelt over it, and put my hand on his throat. The demonic presence laughed, the air expelled from the lungs was foul and reeked of death and journal occupation. Go on, hasten my supplantation. I will end your species mercilessly and eradicate your memory from the minds of all lesser creatures. No one will lament your passing. No dirges will be sung. You will be swept away into oblivion. You eternally with I put my other hand around the neck once I had retrieved the lighter from the front pocket. Despite the hollow laughter that erupted from the foul-smelling mouth, tears swelled and fell from the eyes. Beside the supreme malevolence in them, I saw pain, and even forgiveness. Somewhere, returned to consciousness but barred from full expression, my friend looked up to me. Me, his murderer, bringing the life from his neck. When the deed was done, I rose from the body and grabbed the arms. Even as the colour began to fade from the flesh, another sign of vitality started to gather and spread. A darker pigmentation that bespoke of some evil and inhumane strain of life. Quickly, I dragged what remained of my friend back to the corrupted pond. The water surface was virtually impenetrable, a bubbling sheet of blackness rimmed by drooping and corroded vegetation. Without hesitation, I rolled the body into the sinister pool and watched with disgust as it was consumed by the black waters, becoming first a mass of dissolved organic matter, 
and then settling into an algae-like layer upon the surface. And still, despite the utter destruction of the physical form, I felt the presence of an intelligence among all that filth. Trusting my intuition still unsure to its source, I removed the lighter from my pocket. I then stepped several paces back, flicked it open, and tossed it into the Stygian pool. The result was catastrophic. Upon touching the water's surface, the flames spread instantly, pervasively, shooting across as if the pollution itself was some undiscovered accelerant. In only a few seconds, the entire pond had become a sweltering pool of fire, a liquid born conflagration that surged skyward as if the core of the earth had sent forth some molten column. And shortly after the blaze had arisen, an inhumane scream arose as if the pond itself was sentient and agonized amidst the flames. The cries and burst scattering to the skies in all directions, and the nearby trees reeled back, straying against their own roots to distance themselves from the hellish tumult. A few minutes later, a deep and scorched depression in the earth was all that remained of the pond. No signs of life, terrestrial or otherwise, were visible. All was ash. Tired, he blasted. With every last nerve racked by terror, I stumbled back to the cabin while my brain worked to compose a more plausible explanation for my friend's disappearance.